All right. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I know like we are kind of nearing towards the end of this whirlwind uh, conference around AI. How many of you uh, took part in sessions related to uh, deployment of AI models? Because of course, uh, right from the keynotes, we had like Mistral announcing a lot of their models and uh, a bunch of other open source plus uh, closed source models that are out there, from whether it's from OpenAI or it's from some other uh, uh, you know companies who are releasing these models on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so of course, there have been a lot of talks about how do you run these models, how do you fine tune these models. But of course, another important aspect and why we have kept this workshop in the first place is that when it actually comes to deploying these models, it can be very expensive, as one might uh, consider, because these are fairly large models and you need good uh, compute uh, to be able to run them efficiently and deploy them. So uh, has anyone attended any of the other talks or workshops that have been around the theme of deployment of uh, large language models or generative models? If we can have a raise of hands, if anyone attended any related session or workshop before? Or if anyone of you have any idea, so I just wanted to make this also fairly interactive. So if anyone of you has any idea around uh, or has experienced deploying so, of course, like every one of us has consumed chat GPT, right? But has anyone of you tried deploying your own generative AI model uh, anywhere over here? Um, would you want to probably share like a line or two about how you went about so we can, yeah, we can, you can start share. Uh, stable diffusion in a VM in Azure? In Azure. GPU. With GPU. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything with Kubernetes? Uh, nothing with Kubernetes. Okay, nothing Kubernetes. with Kubernetes. Is a VM, yes, of course. And did you specifically make any optimizations, or did you just went ahead, uh, get got a VM with a GPU cluster, and went ahead and deployed? Yes. Definitely. Okay. Uh, anyone else with probably a slightly different experience than this one? Yeah. Yes, so in our company we're using KSERV. Got it. Yeah. So I mean, that's of course a much more advanced version of being able to deploy. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing. Anyone else, probably without, uh, with any other uh, tooling that you might have used? Okay, um, I think like, so hopefully this session will be a good primer for everyone. Uh, and uh, I would hope that everyone can stay till the end. I'll try to make it as interactive and not bore all of you. So hopefully like you can learn because uh, we have packed uh, together a lot of content in this because the thing is that um, optimizing your Kubernetes cluster for deploying an AI model, you can do multiple things. It, there is no just one single path that today you will learn and you will say that I have become a pro at being able to deploy AI models. There are different techniques. So uh, what we kind of cover is from the very beginning taking baby steps towards what one uh, who is just getting started with AI or generative AI model deployment might think and how do you gradually then make adjustments to your deployment process to make it more efficient. So that's the way that we have kind of structured this workshop. Now, um, again, a caveat is that following the workshop can be a little tricky because, of course, we will have dedicated sessions and uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along certain aspects. But as we know that with, whenever it comes to deploying of uh, cloud-based servers or uh, Kubernetes uh, distributions, it can take like half an hour, one hour at a time. So uh, just bear with me. Like uh, We can discuss the steps and there are a lot of tutorials and links that we have provided uh, in this particular workshop. So you can always follow it along uh, once you go back home. Uh, uh, and in your free time. So just a quick introduction about myself. I'm Shivai. I'm a CNCF and a Wasm Edge uh, ambassador. Uh, Wasm Edge is a WebAssembly runtime. Uh, so there have been a bunch of talks over here at well, as well at uh, the AI dev around WebAssembly uh, on the edge. Uh, if some of you might have probably uh, gone to some of those uh, I think there's a keynote today as well by Michael Yuan. And I'm currently a, a developer relations engineer at Couchbase. It's an NoSQL database company where I lead a lot of the generative AI efforts. Uh, so some of that effort also does involve deploying AI models. And uh, with me, uh, my colleague Shivanshu could not join. He's also a CNCF ambassador and software engineer at Cygnos. Cygnos is an observability platform, uh, so primarily dealing with a lot of open telemetry and collecting AI-related uh, monitoring data. Um, 
Also, a huge thanks to Sivo and Coeb. They they were the ones who uh, provided a free GPU and uh, like free credits. And in fact, like uh, when we'll go through these demos today, like hands-on workshops, you can sign up on these platforms for free and get cloud credits, using which you can basically create a free of cost uh, Qflow cluster and uh, also VMs with GPU support and uh, instances with the latest uh, cutting edge GPUs um, that we typically use for deploying of these uh, generative AI models. Uh, just a bit quick outline. So first we'll just talk about the basic la infrastructure landscape on how AI models are currently getting deployed on top of Kubernetes. We'll have some demos and work. Uh, hopefully, like if you're following along, you can also take out your laptops uh, in the meanwhile, uh, where we'll have uh, a total of two to three different uh, mini workshops that we'll conduct in order to give you an idea of how a typical uh, day of a ML ops engineer looks like, or how a DevOps engineer and their interfacing with an ML engineer looks like during that particular day. And then we'll dive, of course, more deeper into more efficient techniques and why is there a need for uh, efficient techniques for GPU utilization inside of Kubernetes. And um, if you're using an orchestration tool like Kubeflow, uh, if you have anyone, if you have heard of it before, we'll discuss about that slightly. Um, why is there a need for orchestration tools and how do you actually uh, make uh, machine learning deployments more efficient on orchestration platforms? Because they have a slightly different architecture when it comes to uh, just doing uh, regular deployment of your AI model on top of uh, native Kubernetes. So there's a bit of a difference in terms of how you proceed with deployment on orchestration platforms. So as you can see, that we, what we have tried to cover in this workshop is multiple scenarios and uh, try to give you like the best uh, use cases around what you might or what your company might choose to use out of all of these possible scenarios. So hopefully you can uh, take away some of these uh, takeaways. And again, like. At any point in time in the uh, entire uh, workshop, if you have any questions, uh, please do let me know. And uh, I hope that my uh, speed at which I'm going is comfortable. I know like sometimes people say I go, I tend to go a bit fast. So I just want to ensure that everyone is comfortable with my speed. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so let's start with the first segment of ML infrastructure landscape on communities. Now, of course, uh, something that but I assume all of you must be knowing because all of us are at an AI conference having spent almost close to two days that typically the kind of hardware you would require is CPUs. Of course, if you have larger models, uh, primarily if you have uh, either deep learning models or of course these days a lot of the higher end uh, you know, generative AI models, especially with larger context windows. Uh, you can run them on CPUs as well, but of course you will typically use GPUs if you have, uh, if you're dealing with let's say something like a Mistral 7 billion parameter model or a Phi 3 of 6 billion parameter model. There are so many ones that uh, are a bit more optimized with lesser of a context lens that can run on CPU, but of course most of them will require a GPU. And sometimes you can also use TPUs. TPUs are generally created by Google infrastructure, which are optimized for running tensors. So if you have any deep learning models that have a lot of uh, tensor-based infrastructure, then TPUs also perform really well for doing inference and for uh, training of the models. So these are the primary hardware that you typically use. So of course, you could deploy these uh, hardwares on a single VM or on a multi-node uh, virtual machine cluster or, of course, uh, since today we are talking all about Kubernetes, uh, you can also deploy it on Kubernetes as well. Uh, now, of course, uh, let's talk about uh, how do GPUs integrate with Kubernetes itself. So, of course, uh, in a typical Kubernetes architecture, uh, by the way, how many of you are comfortable with Kubernetes have uh, have interacted a, a bit with Kubernetes, at least like understood the architecture. So of course, like today's session will not go into like uh, un understanding the architecture of Kubernetes because that will take like another hour or so. But in a nutshell, it's an orchestration platform that allows you to very easily orchestrate your containerized applications. So uh, normally you will have your main uh, API server and you'll have a bunch of nodes. And uh, these uh, nodes will basically have pods. So these pods will run the actual containerized applications. 
So the way that uh, the GPUs will interact with Kubernetes, so there are primarily two different components that you'll need. The first one is the host level component, which essentially means uh, the actual GPU uh, device itself. So in order to uh, basically find that, yes, whether there's a GPU device actually existing in the Kubernetes cluster and running inside of a node, you need the NVIDIA container toolkit and the NVIDIA GPU drivers. Mm -hmm. Now, this is specific for NVIDIA, but if you have an AMD-based uh, uh, GPU, then you'll have the specific container kit for AMD. And then on the Kubernetes side, you actually need some additional things. For example, you need uh, the k device plugin. So this is the component within Kubernetes that can actually identify those particular pods that have a GPU instance running inside of it. And let's say that now when you are actually running your or uh, you're already deployed your Kubernetes cluster, then whenever you want to find that appropriate uh, pod that has an available GPU, uh, right? it will help you to identify and find that out for you. So all these different components within Kubernetes and these host level components that are uh, essentially part of running these GPUs right, from these vendors like NVIDIA or AMD are required for you to identify and then also be able to run your wo uh, workloads on uh, pods that can use GPU as a supported backend. Otherwise, normally, of course, you'll normally have like a VM that uses CPU. So this is the way that uh, you interface with uh, GPUs inside of Kubernetes. Uh, and this is an example of how your rough YAML would look like. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, as we mentioned earlier, that Kubernetes has support for both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs that you can basically use across different nodes. And uh, this is typically uh, managed with the help of these device plugins. So essentially, what you'll do is that um, inside of your actual uh, deployment script, or in this case, this YAML that you'll use uh, inside of your Kubernetes cluster, you can see that we have uh, the image as NVIDIA with CUDA, and then uh, we have basically given that, OK, I need two instances of GPUs uh, over here in, the, in my resources. So that's an example of that I need two uh, GPUs inside of my cluster. So that's a typical example of how your YAML would basically look like uh, when you are in integrating your GPUs with Kubernetes. Um, <clears throat> and so yeah, this is, I think, like I probably had double slides. But um, so before we now jump into the next aspect of uh, like understanding how do you actually optimize the usage of GPUs, we have a, a small workshop. Now feel free to also follow along uh, if you are if you're all of you are interested. But I can understand if you are tired. Uh, I can walk you through and uh, the demo. Like we have a dedicated. Uh, entire blog post just around how you can leverage it. But there are multiple ways in which actually you can uh, deploy an AI model on top of GPUs instead of Kubernetes. Uh, there are multiple tools, like the entire machine learning ecosystem is so vast. There are open source tools like MLflow. There is uh, Open LLM, Bento ML. All of these essentially uh, similar to how you containerize your application code inside of a typical DevOps lifecycle. You can think of uh, an ML deployment as that you take your model weights, your model artifacts. Uh, you can always, you know, uh, always containerize them inside of Docker and then serve them inside of a Kubernetes cluster, similar to how you do like a typical application code. So that is something that you can also do. Uh, in this case, uh, this ex particular example will show you how you can uh, build your own custom chat GPT uh, like interface uh, with the web UI, but also actually serve something like a Llama 3 uh, on top of your device. and. Um, we, over here, we are using Olama. So Olama, uh, there's actually a meetup today, I think. How many of you are going to that meetup? Olama meetup is happening after today's event. So Olama is an open source project that allows you to run uh, any AI model, like generative AI model, locally in your device. So it's it's fairly good if like if you want to experiment with any local large language model. So Olama is a really uh, nice tool that I'll recommend to everyone, especially if you are interfacing with. Oh, I think uh, let me go to a new shell. So um, you can just use Olama. So Olama. 
Uh, here you can see like all the list of models that I have right now. So it's like Docker uh, container over here. You can see that I have like Llama 3. So if I just do O Llama serve, it's basically running uh, on this particular port. It is running uh, the Llama 3 model at this particular port. So you can directly then interface uh, with uh, any AI, uh, any open large language model directly. So uh, in this particular demo that we are going to be running, uh, we are going to be following this particular guide. Um, so for this, all of you can also set up a free Sivo uh, cloud. Uh, so it's it's free. So Sivo is basically a um, Kubernetes provider. And I'll, I'll just log out for better understanding. But basically, when you create an account on Sivo, you get a $250 free credit. And this is good enough for you to like follow today's tutorial and even keep your uh, VM uh, running for, like I think, a good one week. So it will not cost, uh, cost that much. So I'll definitely recommend that you can test it out. Because uh, see, the thing is that when you, uh, you know, use something like a Google Cloud or an Azure or a AWS, uh, a lot of you might have seen that it's very complex to actually set up everything. So at least the thing with Sivo is that it's a little easier to manage your Kubernetes uh, so you don't have to uh, like you know spend a lot of time trying to debug your cluster so that is why i'm using this but of course you can use dk you can use any cloud provider like uh, it's not uh, just sivo that you can use uh, they just provide 250 dollars credit so you can you know jump into this entire ai deployment with kubernetes so um, if you want to follow along right now uh, is anyone interested to follow along right now by the way or can we like I'm not sure uh, what's how is everyone feeling right now. <laughs> we'll watch you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, in that case, uh, if you don't want to follow along, that's perfectly fine. Uh, so you just sign up, add your credit card. Um, I'll just log in because I already have um, over here. So I'll just quickly log in into my um, dashboard. So here, uh, this is how the interface kind of looks like, and I'll also open up this particular guide that uh, everyone can follow along. So this one is like, how do you create your own private chat GPT with Llama 3 and a Sivo GPU cluster? So essentially, what it will do is that it will spin up a new VM with one of the state-of-the-art uh, GPU models, uh, which is, I think, the NVIDIA A1000 or A100. Uh, those are some of the uh, ones that are most typically recommended for uh, being able to like serve uh, your typical large language models. Um, now. Uh, just to kind of give you a glimpse of what we are basically covering here is that all of the deployment over here will be done with the help of Terraform. Uh, how many of you, what is Terraform? Anyone uh, can yeah, do, want to probably share what is Terraform? Uh, infrastructure management banker. Yeah. So in this case, like for this particular demo, you don't have to worry about having to click multiple buttons and uh, manually set up a VM. So everything will be taken care by the Terraform script. So in this case, um, this is basically the GitHub repository. So what I'll actually go ahead and do is I'll just uh, you know directly go to this repository. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if, if, if I have Terraform locally, but I'll just go ahead and create a code space on GitHub. I find them to be really nice for giving demos because sometimes uh, you never know that your local uh, you know, device, uh, sometimes it might run into issues. So I typically like to give workshop demos with a GitHub uh, code space. Um, so we'll just wait for it to set up. But the idea over here is that um, you barely just have to do like two different things. One is have an active Sivo account, which you can just sign up and within five to 10 minutes, it should be active and keep uh, an API key active. So for getting your API key, uh, you just go over to uh, your dashboard, and hopefully it should be in the settings menu uh, inside of the profile and uh, inside of, I think, security. Yeah. So over here, I'll uh, regenerate my API key, and I'll use that. But uh, basically, um, I think now we are good to go. So in this case, the only thing that you need is basically an active Sivo account. Uh, if you were doing this on AWS, you'd basically need an AWS account with an active AWS, uh, you know, an active uh, GK or in AWS EKS cluster. So here, um, 
what you are going to be deploying is basically Olama, which I showed you is that uh, tool, open source tool that allows you to interface with any large language model of your choice. Uh, you can, if you want, you can also directly deploy the large language model using some other framework like Open LLM. Uh, this is also another framework which uh, allows you to basically run any open source large language model in the cloud locally. Uh, this is another such project. But Olama, I think, is by far the most uh, popular open source project that is out there that allows you to run any. So you, as you can see, like they have close to 75,000 uh, stars on GitHub. So it's one of the most popular uh, ways of running uh, large language models on, on your device. So that's why we are choosing uh, Olama. And then uh, the other component that we'll basically deploy with the help of Terraform is Open Web UI. So this is like an uh, chat GPT like uh, front end uh, application that allows you to interface with any large language model of your choice. So as you know, like with chat GPT, you can only use OpenAI models. But this will give you a UI where you can choose any large language model that you have running locally. And you can pick and choose between uh, them. So uh, I'll just go ahead and I've already, you know, kind of cloned this GitHub repository. Uh, in this case, uh, the next thing that I have to basically do is uh, go into the, uh, the actual repository. And uh, let me just zoom in a bit more. So inside of Infra, I, I'll have basically this uh, TF folder. So I'll go into this TF directory. And here, uh, I'll have to basically set up one, um, like over here, you'll find that there's this variables.tf. Uh, so this is where we'll basically also put our uh, CVO API, like this API key. So within uh, the infra tf, um, we have this variables.tf uh, file, where we basically have to update the terraform.tf vars file with the CVO API, because of course, that will be used for authenticating to CVO Cloud. So um, I can just simply go ahead and move this particular file as uh, it says over here. And now, uh, since we have the terraform.tfwars, I'll quickly go ahead, regenerate a new API key, and copy this and paste it inside over here. All right. So this should be good to go. And now the next step that we have to basically do is that once we have set our API key, basically uh, now everything will be taken care by Terraform. It will not only set up the actual VM with the dedicated GPU, it will also uh, pull the images of Olama, serve that, serve the, uh, you know, the web UI, uh, and do it all for you. So you basically just have to run the Terraform INET uh, code over here. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so I'll have to install Terraform. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's install it on Linux. And again, uh, you don't have to necessarily go with the Terraform route. Um, if you want to manually uh, do all these steps on your own, uh, feel free to do so. Like That will only require you to. This is uh, just to quickly show you that uh, rather than spending time on actually manually like you know, taking up all the time and um, like spending all the time in actually creating, an act, uh, creating the uh, Kubernetes cluster, which is not necessarily relevant for uh, this particular session. Uh, Terraform just allows you to um, just quickly go ahead and do all those or reduce all that manual effort, uh, having to you know uh, set up everything from scratch. So uh, let's just quickly install Terraform, and I think we should be good to go with this. So if I type Terraform now, we have it. So Terraform in it. Um, and finally, like once we do the Terraform in it, when uh, so basically it will initialize an empty Terraform repository, and then we'll basically go ahead and run Terraform apply uh, to to basically initialize the Terraform repository. And finally, when we use Terraform apply, it will apply the actual plan that is responsible for doing all of the deployment. So hopefully, uh, Terraform init should have worked. And let's use Terraform plan. And finally, uh, we should have Terraform apply. So with this, um, it will probably ask us to accept 
that will do all of this for us. Uh, okay, so <laughs> the reason why it failed was that I had already created one uh, beforehand, but uh, basically the thing is that as you'll follow this, uh, it will automatically save everything for you. And then if you go to your CO cluster inside of the compute, you will find, um, so inside of the Kubernetes, let me go over here. Yeah, so over here you'll see that uh, in this case, I have this LLM boilerplate, which is uh, running over here. So um, what you'll see is that once you have basically run this, it usually takes up to 10 minutes because provisioning the actual infrastructure you know, takes some time. So it takes up to uh, 10 minutes to actually set up this uh, CVO Kubernetes cluster to assign the GPU node and then deploy the Helm charts uh, for Olama, for uh, you know, the Llama 3 project, all, all of those. And uh, once it's up and running, if you go to your um, actual Kubernetes cluster, so here you can see the cluster information. Uh, this is where you can see that this is my load balancer and uh, this is my deploy. UI for Olama, uh, which has been set up after you basically run the Terraform apply script. So that will, uh, after 10 minutes, it will go ahead and deploy it. And when you go to the actual Kubernetes um, tab inside of your CVO dashboard, uh, it will show you that the actual UI is running on this public URL. So actually, I can go ahead and uh, access this particular, um, and you can see that I have this entire like chat GPT like interface and this is all open source. So open UI, uh, it, it, it is able to detect that I have Llama 3 installed. So that works well. And I can perhaps like ask it a question. Uh, hopefully it, it, it is able to respond to us. Live demos always are a bit tricky. But again, considering that all of this is open source, um, now again, live demos can always be a bit tricky. So hopefully uh, we are not getting any issue. Uh, with the network. OK, so it works. Perfect. But yeah, the, the idea really is that you didn't have to uh, do any sort of background work in understanding how do you create a, like, you know, a, a file. So of course, this is one way of looking at this thing, right? Like one way of understanding uh, that uh, in our Terraform scripts, if we just probably do a bit more deep dive into the actual code, right? Uh, if you look at the actual Terraform script that we have. So for instance, when we wanted to deploy the actual CO cluster, uh, here you can see that we have the Terraform file for deploying the cluster, Kubernetes cluster. Um, here uh, we define the firewall and the network. And then uh, as we are basically setting up our Olama, um, all of those are basically like, you know, we are just defining the specific uh, Helm charts for Olama. We are having the Helm chart for OpenAI, uh, for, uh, sorry, for uh, the Olama UI. And similarly, like uh, the setting up of the GPU node itself on the cluster is also being taken care of by uh, this Terraform script. But alternatively, if you are more into like, setting up everything from scratch. There are uh, you know, tools like MLflow. So for example, uh, there's this entire uh, guide on how do you deploy. If you don't have a large language model, let's say, if you have a simple model, you can leverage something like an MLflow. And here, uh, like I think you mentioned you had used KSERV. So uh, KSERV uh, basically is, again, a platform uh, similar to like TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch, which allows you to basically uh, auto-scale your, um, your uh, LLMs or even regular AI models, for that matter. Um, so here, basically, you will install like MLflow. You will set up a Kubernetes cluster. You would train the model if you, if you don't have a model already trained. And MLflow will basically uh, take care of even the training for you. So you can visualize all of your training cycles. Um, and then you can uh, do some hyperparameter tuning if that's required, um, if you want to optimize the performance of the model. And then what you do is you basically package the model inside of um, a model registry. So you can either do it in Docker, or you can use like MLflow itself to uh, use uh, to basically package uh, and register your model. So MLflow comes with its own registry, but you can also use uh, a standard Docker container to package together your model. And then you can serve it uh, with the help of uh, KServe, and uh, you can actually also deploy it uh, on top of KServe inside of a Kubernetes cluster, where you'll basically build the Docker image, um, you'll push it to the Docker hub, 
and uh, you'll have like this kind of a YAML which where you define the actual uh, where your image for your model exists. So you know the actual uh, Docker image, and uh, then you'll just use like a uh, kube control uh, apply and uh, basically deploy your inference service. So this is a very typical, I mean, this is something that uh, you'll find a lot of guides on. Uh, but primarily what, you know, uh, use case that uh, I wanted to show was that especially for deploying any large language model, you typically need a GPU cluster. So that is why uh, when I showed in that particular presentation on how the interface would look like, so typically like uh, you'll have to define a GPU inside of your uh, Kubernetes cluster if you want to do any kind of uh, generative AI specific or uh, some kind of inference that is very, uh, you know, compute intensive. So in that case, you will need a GPU to be used. Uh, but that was uh, basically the first demo. Again, a fairly short demo because, of course, uh, the main uh, context for this entire workshop is not uh, just deployment, but also to understand that, yes, OK, I deployed this AI model, uh, but this is not a use case probably that I'll use in production. Because in production, I might have even larger models than Llama 3. Or I might have to fine tune my large language model, which requires additional set of steps that require you to uh, change certain weights of the model. Or I might have an entire complex series of multiple models that I'm using. Right. So you could be using, uh, like, let's say, a stable diffusion model to generate an image based on a prompt. Then you have a Llama 3 model that uh, looks at that image and it describes it, let's say. So, I mean, you could, you can think that there can be multiple use cases where you might need multiple deployments, multiple types of models. So, this kind of simple deployment will not work there. So, we have to see that how do we uh, deal with situations where you have to deal with multiple GPUs, right? Uh, this is an example of just setting up one or two GPUs. But there are a lot of use cases where you might need five or six GPUs inside of your uh, cluster. So just to give an, give an example, uh, in my previous startup that I uh, founded, uh, we were basically using AI to detect uh, soccer athletes. So we were detecting not only the athletes, but what kind of actions they were performing. So we had like one AI model, computer vision model, for object detection, object tracking. We had a separate model for uh, now being able to do like action recognition. We had a separate AI model for detecting their jersey number, jersey color. All of these were separate AI models that were all part of a pipeline. And when it came to deployment of such kind of a complex workflow, you needed like dedicated GPUs for running individual workloads and being able to, uh, you know, then also scale them up. So of course, these kind of uh, things are what we uh, see in a uh, real life scenario. So we'll now move away from that basic uh, use case to more complex use cases where you need more GPUs, right? And uh, we'll also see that how do you make the GPU utilization more cost effective? Because, uh, of course, as you might imagine, that running GPUs is very costly uh, because they are very com like they are very power hungry, and you will sooner than later realize that uh, so many companies are actually facing these, these uh, facing this these days that they anticipate that okay, like I have just deployed you know five uh, GPU clusters, how much will that cost? But then they see like a forty thousand dollar bill on AWS, and then you know they have to make urgent uh, adjustments. So that is why like, we'll also discuss about a lot of techniques that allow you to make more efficient use of GPUs when you are not completely aware, because of course, right now we are in a stage where every one of us is exploring Gen AI, we are uh, using it for the first time in our companies, or we are probably still experimenting and seeing that, you know, whether it's a good fit. And cost uh, of deploying them is the biggest concern. So um, when we are basically running GPUs with Kubernetes, right, mm -hmm. uh, the biggest issue uh, that we face over here is um, that Serving LLMs is expensive, um, as we have already mentioned, right? Because they typically require you to use high-end GPUs like NVIDIA A100. And uh, the other important aspect to also understand is that just the behavior of a large language model is that mostly uh, there is a sequential nature in terms of how it basically does the processing of any kind of uh, task that you actually give to it, which basically essentially means that 
an example here that one A100, because of the sequential nature of the large language model, so when it comes to doing the inference or the serving, it would mean that can, it can only process one or less than one request per second, which basically screams that it is very unoptimized. And since for production scale you need tons of GPUs, you can imagine that if your GPU is only making one uh, request uh, or processing only one request per second, it's going to be extremely disastrous. So uh, that is where the first thing that we'll talk about is using something like VLLM. So VLLM is a project that allows uh, for very easy LLM inference and serving. Uh, it basically uh, reduces some of those issues which come with, uh, you know, uh, the limitations that come with native implementation of GPUs inside of Kubernetes. Because in native GPU uh, Kubernetes, like you will basically have static batching. But with uh, using VLLM, you can enforce dynamic batching inside of your cluster. And also, you get um, something which is called as paged attention. So these techniques just make it much more, uh, so like without diving too deep into the technical details of how that works behind the scenes, uh, these techniques that are offered by VLLM allow you to be more optimized in terms of just being more faster in terms of that processing. So rather than having to wait for your requests, you can like, you know, similar to how you do batching of any API, right? You can make it much more faster to be able to do these uh, inference calls uh, for your AI models. So, um, and the great thing is that it also supports your NVIDIA AMD GPUs, and it can run on top of Kubernetes as well. So that means you can very easily pair up a VLLM inside of your same GPU cluster that you are running on Kubernetes. Uh, and make your uh, inference much more faster by just the introduction of VLLM. And that is what like, a lot of companies will do in production. Um, now, we have a workshop of uh, using uh, VLLM. Uh, again, uh, if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. Um, for this, uh, we'll be using a service called as Coeb. So Coeb, um, uh, some of you might have seen the Coeb folks here at the conference. Like, there were quite a few of them. So some of you might have probably had a, a chance of interacting with them. They have been having this entire uh, one week of uh, deployments that uh, they are doing. And very recently, they have now added support for uh, GPUs inside of, their, um, inside of their entire system. So um, basically, Coeb is like, you know, an infrastructure uh, provider, so similar to like Vercel or Netlify, you can deploy uh, to production. Uh, I have a GitHub repository for this, uh, which you can follow along. So I think I forgot to add the link of the GitHub repository, but uh, let me uh, share this across with everyone. And by the way, like the slides and all the links will be there at the end. I have a QR code, you can scan that. Uh, but let me go quickly to my um, dev workshop over here. So uh, this is basically the readme that we'll follow along. So the idea is that uh, on Coeb, uh, you can sign up. Uh, and uh, right now, to get the GPU, you'll just have to fill up a form. So you'll not have immediate access to the, uh, to the GPU. So um, you can sign up for the GPU access. I'll just share the links uh, over here. So in this case, uh, you can sign up for free, and you can join the preview if you wish to get uh, like the um, GPU support. Like, so it will be a GPU-backed um, model. But once you basically sign in, it would look something like this. So this is uh, me signed in, and I also actually have access to the GPU because uh, mine got just approved today. So you just need to get access by filling up this uh, form, um, and you'll be able to get access to the GPU cluster. Now, uh, what you have to basically do is um, you can clone this particular GitHub repository. Uh, it's uh, you can I, I can just probably uh, zoom in a bit more. Um, it's just a AI underscore dev uh, hyphen workshop. So the idea again is that uh, instead of doing a regular deployment of a GPU cluster inside of Kubernetes, we are now going to be leveraging VLLM. And uh, 
VLN, of course, as we saw that with its optimization techniques for better batch processing and paging, uh, it's just a bit faster to do that. So here I have a bunch of Docker files that uh, will allow me to uh, basically uh, interact with the OpenAI interface for VLNM. And in this case, the model that I'll basically use is a Gemma 2 model, a 2 billion parameter model. So uh, for those folks who don't know, uh, Gemma is an source open model. Um, so in order to interact with this, there are, a, again, a couple of prerequisites that you have to follow. Uh, you'll basically first have to sign up for COEV. Uh, you'll also have to sign up on Hugging Face, uh, because specifically for the Google Gemma 2 model, you need to um, acknowledge the conditions that have been set. So if you have already acknowledged them, then you just have to go to your uh, profile settings. And inside of here, if you go to the settings, you will be able to go to the access tokens and uh, create a new access token for yourself. So just create an account in Coeb, uh, get the access to the GPU instance, sign up on Hugging Face, and you should be good to go. So now uh, we'll go over to Coeb. We'll create a new service. So what you have to do is you have to create a new web service. So our uh, model will be uh, available through and web API, so, and then you can use curl to basically test it out. So we'll create a new web service. Here, if you either have an image for your, um, for your actual model, or if you have the Docker file for your model uh, inside of GitHub, you can choose GitHub. So in this case, I'll uh, basically choose uh, this particular example, VLLM. Um, that's my GitHub repository. So that's the same GitHub repository with my Docker file, and all of these different uh, uh, files that you see. So over here, you'll see that there's a GPU access. And uh, this is when you'll basically get, you'll be able to get access to all of these particular uh, GPUs. So in this case, I'll take the access for the RTX uh, 4000. And uh, then you just have to change a few things. For example, instead of uh, build back, you have to choose Docker file, because we are going to be having a Docker file. And uh, we are going to be running this. Uh, I think we can also change the health check from grace period from 5 to 300. And I think we should be good to go. And yeah, we need two environment variables. So we need uh, the hugging face token. So in this case, uh, the token that I generated over here. So I can quickly go ahead and invalidate and create a new one. And I also need to basically provide it the name of the model. So in this case, um, the name of the model that you can find uh, is over here. So for example, we are using the Google Gemma 2 billion model. So we'll go ahead and use that. And this should be good to go. So we have, deplo we have basically configured our service, uh, the Docker file, which contains our um, VLLM. And VLLM is what is being used to actually serve and deploy uh, the, the model. So let's go ahead and uh, click on Deploy. Oh, so I think uh, because I already have one service running, let me go ahead and uh, close this one. So this is the one that I had uh, created earlier. So let me go ahead and delete this service. All right. Um, so while we are waiting for this to delete, we'll just quickly go ahead and uh, create this again. So it will not take a lot of time. VLLM, I'll choose the GPU instance. Um, here, I'll choose a Docker file, because we are using a Docker file. Uh, let me just quickly also set up my tokens. And again, like if, anyone, any, uh, if anyone has any questions so far, please uh, you know, do let us know. Um, I'd love to take up those questions. And then we have this over here. Oh, sorry. I have to choose. Um, this is the model. So I choose the model. And then I'll choose um, the health check to be 300 seconds. And go ahead and deploy. Oh, I think like because the first one is still getting. Uh, but the idea is that uh, once I think hopefully this one is still getting removed. So we'll just wait for this to get deployed. But the idea is that once this gets deployed, it will have a public URL. You can test it uh, you know, using localhost. Uh, like you can either use a curl request, um, or you can you know, uh, use it as a web, web service, because it's basically getting deployed as a web service. So we'll wait, we'll wait for that to happen. Uh, but till then, does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. Can you explain again uh, what VLLM is doing here? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So see, like basically there are uh, two things, and let me go back to that particular slide. Yeah. So um, primarily the, the two main features that you see are the dynamic batching and the uh, paged um, attention. So now, uh, in a typical scenario, uh, when we are only using Kubernetes and running a GPU instance on top of native Kubernetes, it is using static batching. That, and what that means is that um, you're only getting, so since we mentioned right that with a typical LLM response, uh, it's having sequential response. And the way that the GPU is also interacting is that it is only executing one request at a time. So it's sequential in nature. While that is fine, but uh, it is not scalable. If you want multiple requests to be executed at the same time, or you want the capability for your um, for your VLLM in this case, or the GPUs to be able to process multiple uh, requests at the same time. That's where VLLM with its uh, dynamic batching will help you to be to be able to accomplish that. So inherently, it increases the overall uh, speed of being able to actually do the inference because right now the inference is only happening happening uh, sequentially. If that makes sense. So that's the first part, which is uh, the static batching versus the dynamic batching. So that's one use case. And then uh, if you kind of look at um, over here in this particular diagram, I know like the diagrams are a bit, a bit small, but basically um, you have like a key value cache that you create when you are basically uh, having all these different slots. So for instance, now let's say that um, you're, you have multiple GPU pods. So some of them are currently being used for executing some task, but some of them, once they have, uh, some of the other pods have uh, completed their tasks, so they might open up, right? So you can uh, easily schedule um, the new ones to be used. So uh, VLLM will take care of all of that, scheduling of how, them, how to use them, and uh, of course, like with the scalability, as I mentioned. So those are the two main aspects of how it's basically uh, leveraging uh, the actual GPU clusters behind the scene to make them more efficient. So those are the two ways. So um, I think we should have gotten this one to be deleted. Oh, yeah, perfect. So I think now we should be able to deploy this. So it will, again, take a bit of time because um, you know, it's deploying an actual VM right now. So um, while we wait for this to uh, build and, uh, you know, like because the build will run and then the provisioning will happen. So again, this might take roughly five, 10 minutes to complete. So while we do that, um, we'll just uh, move a bit further ahead. Uh, so the next one is that, of course, like we covered, you know, the deployment of the AI model with the VLLM. Now, if you also want to run VLLM on top of Kubernetes, uh, there's this really nice uh, guide on uh, Google Cloud, which uh, where you can serve the same Gemma model that we did, but uh, instead of doing it on a regular VM, how you can do it on top of GK, on top of Kubernetes. So feel free to have a look at this. The only difference between our, uh, like the strategy that I just showed you with Coeb, was that I was deploying my VM as a web service, but you could always you know, again, package it together instead of a containerized service and then run it instead of a, a cluster, instead of a GPU cluster. So that's uh, running uh, VLLM with GPUs on top of Kubernetes instead of a web service or like a VM. Uh, now, that is the one, the, that is the first set of challenges that we saw with, uh, with Kubernetes and running GPUs on top of Kubernetes. The other one is uh, also fairly peculiar. And this actually stems from the fact that if you have a lot of different uh, models, some of them can be large language models, some of them can also be your smaller models. So um, all of them will basically use uh, varying levels of compute required. For example, a Mistral or a Llama 3 model might require two powerful NVIDIA a A100s, like their full capacity. But whereas um, a small model like a stable diffusion model, or like let's say you know um, perhaps if you are just like doing a mobile net model, so that will not require perhaps even a full NVIDIA A100. Uh, there's a concept where you can basically slice your entire GPU into different shards, and you can 
use uh, just two or three of these shards for being able to uh, like you know um, use them only for one model and then the remaining shards of the same gpu can be used for training another or inferencing another model so in this case what we saw was that since uh, there's a varying level like you know every model will require different amount of resource consumption that is required for doing the inference a lot of times uh, a lot of these gpus are just idle and you're basically paying for that idle cost you're not leveraging it so this is not something that you you would want to do in production so in order to optimize the usage of your models even more uh, that's what we'll basically see that how do we solve these particular uh, issues so the first one is uh, essentially dividing your gpu so similar to how you have database sharding you can shard you can just think of your gpu having multiple instances like the same one gpu but you have broken it down into different shards and now uh, depending on the size of the model there might be a small model that only needs like two uh, shards from your entire gpu so here is like one example where we have we are basically requesting for just a fraction of a gpu instead of having to request an entire gpu and uh, this is great if uh, you want to uh, not have to uh, waste the utilization of the entire gpu because through experimentation you know that for this specific ml model you only need two uh, like you know one uh, shard and the remaining then can be used for solving some other task or for uh, doing uh, inference for some other model so this way the same gpu now can be uh, utilized for doing different tasks and this way you end up using the entire gpu and don't have parts of the gpu that are just sitting idle so that's one way to solve it the other way is uh, time slicing so this is a technique where basically um, you have the same gpu cluster but you are sharing it across with multiple workflows so like let's say as soon as one workflow gets over that same gpu will now get allocated to the next workflow in line so it's like a orchestration you can say in in, in a way like um, you know similar to how threads work that one threads uh, one thread ends and then then the net, the next thread gets allocated or in i think in databases we talk about uh, deadlocks right it's like one lock is right now there then when it gets over then the next one so similarly in this case uh, when a gpu is attached to one service as soon as that inference gets over it will get uh, now it will start getting utilized for the next service so by this uh, defining the shared term you are able to then uh, use that particular gpu for uh, time slicing and get like uh, shared access uh, another one that we'll not uh, go too deep into is uh, in a, another technique called mps again this uh, allows you to share your gpu resources among amongst multiple pods uh, this more this dives more deeper into the nvidia kernel itself so we'll not like go too deep into it but these are some of the ways but there are certain limitations when it comes to all yeah yeah sorry um, uh, as i understood on the hunter wisdom time slicing was kind of uh, an pattern because of the io that's going on between the unloading and the loading exactly is that changing in any way or yeah in in a way yes so with uh, the next concept that we'll basically tell you which is around dynamic resource allocation which is what is happening these days like most companies nvidia ibm uh, red hat microsoft google everyone is implementing dra which is dynamic resource allocation which basically solves all of these issues so whether it's uh, being able to dynamically uh, during runtime or uh, dynamically tell me that okay how should my slicing look like my time slicing or how should my uh, the first thing that i had spoke about was basically the sharding of your database right a sharding of your gpu uh, which is uh, the multi instance gpu so we like it's a short form for mic which is multi instance gpu that your same gpu is being used for multiple uh, things because you have divided it so being able to do so dynamically resolves a lot of the uh, issues that we find uh, and again i and i completely agree that uh, it can be considered as an anti pattern but so the most uh, used uh, thing that you'll see uh, you'll see these days is dynamic mig which is dynamic multi instance gpu support which means that um, you don't have to define it by default 
during the runtime when your application executing you can define how your gpu needs to needs to be uh, divided and which workloads will require how much uh, access like all of that can be defined by the user so the uh, the dra helps with that and again i think um, I'm not entirely sure how much it fixes that issue with the time slicing bit, but it it definitely enhances even the time slicing some of the limitations that you have with typical time slicing uh, use case. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So primarily, uh, you know, what the things is that um, now, for example, you look at uh, no support for having more than one GPU type per node. So what this means is that uh, generally uh, you can have different types. Uh, defined for your GPU, uh, but uh, with these uh, things that we just discussed, uh, you know, with the standard MIG or the time slicing, you can uh, not have more than one GPU type per node. And the biggest constraint I would say is that you cannot dynamically provision your uh, breaking of your GPU cluster uh, for new incoming requests. For example, if you have a dynamic request coming to your uh, cluster that you know uh, sometimes there might be five requests sometimes there might be two requests so if there are five requests you might want to probably break your gpus into even further further bits so you can imagine right that sometimes there will be requests that perhaps requires a model that needs more compute but there might be certain traffic coming to your uh, to your software that are leveraging models that have lesser compute so Dynamically being able to uh, divide your GPU and use it for inferencing, uh, that is not possible with this approach. So all of these are some of the limitations, which of course are basically uh, um, covered or overtaken by DRA. So DRA is what is basically the latest concept that everyone should be aware of. And this is where my uh, colleague will now talk about it. So I think like this, this is the most important aspect of today's uh, session and the most relevant considering like 2024. So uh, please do have a listen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session. This is Shivan Shu. Uh, I'm a founding engineer at Cygnos. We are open element native observability company. Without further delay, let's get started with the demo. We are going to look at DRA and how it helps in configuring dynamically configuring GPU resources for your Kubernetes cluster. So I think by now everyone is familiar with DRA. It got released in Kubernetes 1.26 as alpha. And in 1.30, you can enable it explicitly. So it helps in dynamically sharing resources between pods and containers. It helps in utilizing the resources within a node. It exposes an API which uh, different DRA drivers can implement. So for example, in our case, it's going to be NVIDIA or KDS DRA driver, through which you can dynamically allocate GPU resources to your applications. So the use case is very simple. If you have a single GPU and you want to share that GPU among different pods, you can do that. If you want to have different GPU claims for a single pod, you can do that. Under the hood, it uses multiple um, components. So like NVIDIA container runtime, NVIDIA container runtime toolkit, NVIDIA driver. So every component has its different uh, functionality. So any container engine, Docker or container D, you can run an OCI compliant runtime. Here, this is NVIDIA container runtime. And then NVIDIA container runtime injects the NVIDIA container toolkit script as a pre-hook of run C which internally uses NVIDIA driver to allocate GPU resources. So these are the different components that are involved. Um, NVIDIA device plugin helps in exposing the GPUs on each node of your cluster, keep track of health of your GPUs, run GPU-enabled containers on your cluster. Um, this, this concept of multi-instance GPU, which got introduced recently in A100 and other GPUs of NVIDIA. Basically, that helps breaking down a GPU in user space isolated in small GPU ins instances that are called MIGs, which a Kubernetes cluster can use to run different containers. Um, NVIDIA GPU operator basically helps in, in installing all those different components like NVIDIA container runtime, um, NVIDIA GPU drivers, it uses the operator framework actually to 
to that and it also maintains the life cycles of all these components so from a bottom up it's um, the linux distribution container engine kubernetes nvidia drivers container toolkit and then different containers running using the gpu drivers and you can then inference the multi instance gpu using the plugin itself there's the cgm based monitoring um, which you can use to monitor your gpus you can use any open source tools prometheus grafana signos to monitor and visualize your matrix um, yeah this is how this is similar to uh, the previous diagram where the container toolkit and nvidia container runtime manages the life cycles of the friend containers and allocate them the mix um, so in a nutshell this is how the flow looks like you have one pod which is have a which is having a resource claim um, using a resource claim template and then that template is using a resource class name um, here wait for first consumer to actually deploy uh, and allocate that gpu um, the flow is like kubernetes scheduler uh, the pod request for the resource claim um, that goes to that particular kubelet running on that node that kubelet plugin takes care using the controller driver interacting with the dra to allocate the gpu and when you have a free gpu available that gets uh, deployed so it's like the same thing but in a detailed manner like the resource claim is made to the scheduler the scheduler extends that resource to the kubelet kubelet interacts with the device plugin looks for the now uh, free gpu and runs the pod um so using this so for example if you are using a gke uh, with an nvidia 800 gpu you can actually break that down into multiple mix and each individual mix can be used to run a different uh, container which is running a different model so the on a physical layer uh, this is how the that mic allocation happens it cannot happen vertically because we need to ensure the user space isolation between different mics um and that's why they cannot have the vertical overlap um in 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 the demo that we are going to see we have one nvidia a100 gpu which is broken down into four mics and this is how it looks like the mic devices in the memory allocated to individual mic so let's look everything in action so before we start let's see if meg is enabled on our cluster you can see that meg mode current is enabled and if i look at uh, the all the mix that are there meg profiles that are available to use there is these many different on the partitions uh, like we see in here and if i look at the actual mix that are being created they are like four mix so let's see so it's a two so it's a, it's a kind cluster with two nodes um one is a controller one is worker node so if i look at the nodes these are the nodes and let's see the driver interface that we have in the cluster um so we have nvidia cdi driver basically we are using the kdes dra driver repo and we are driving into the crucial aspects to make um dra work with uh, nvidia and nvidia drivers and we are looking at the different configure configurations that are important so let's see the container run time the container run time needs to be configured to use nvidia container cli nvidia container run time and uh, yeah, you can see the default container run time the hooks are configured and uh, let's look at the docker daemon okay so the docker daemon is configured to use nvidia as a default run time and it's using nvidia container run time which is needed to run 
and hello everyone welcome to the session here's the repo for the demo which is are in the resources to take a look at how to actually create this in your cluster um over to shivai thank you one thing i might have missed one second so I, i hope that kind of gave you an glimpse of how <coughs> when you set up the uh, dra it showed you i think like this this particular diagram perhaps will be the most interesting for everyone which is um, just being able to imagine that one single gpu is now being able to run so many different ai models this in itself saves you so much uh, time and effort and is like that's the most effective strategy that you want to to maximize the utilization of your a uh, cluster to such an extent to of your gpus to such an extent that no uh, time is being spent for it being going under utilized mm -hmm. and at the same time uh, i mean there are other techniques as well using which you can always uh, reduce the gpu clock cycle that can also save you some power uh, because you don't have to run them at full uh, speed or full length at all times so that is a quick uh, demo uh, of uh, mig running um and then we we'll now kind of proceed the towards the uh, last part of uh, the section so here is like a couple of uh, repositories where uh, we have deployed a vllm so you basically get the benefit of dra plus vllm and again this is something that is still very very new as in like it's still being explored since the past 5 uh, 6 months now um, like personally we had a lot of a uh, tough time setting it up on a number of different uh, gpus on cloud with nvidia 8000 because a lot of uh, cloud providers including sivo right now do not have support for dra so it's actively supported in aws and gk but uh, we were not able to get uh, hands on to a gpu of that size because you know like we have uh, we have the free tier and you need to apply for it uh, it takes a bit of time but if you do have an happen to have like a gk cluster you can set up that kind of architecture where now um, every single gpu that you have uh, within the mig the every single mig that you have can now be allocated for a particular uh, because as uh, you saw that we can deploy any container on each of those mix so one container could be running a stable diffusion model another container could be running a any xyz model like text to text to speech speech to text whatever right so that's the great benefit of being able to use uh, dra and of course uh, now with vllm you get faster inferencing and with uh, the dra you get much better allocation and utilization of your uh, gpus as well so combining both the benefits of vllm and the dra uh, pro proves to be a really great implementation and improvement over the standard uh, way in which community uh, communities uh, deals with uh, with um, llms like right? you know with uh, gpus because that's very limited in its capability so that is why uh, the kubernetes community has been really uh, you know uh, reliant on external contributions or uh, contributions from the public uh, such as the vllm project and dra for us to be able to make more better optimization utilization of uh, kubernetes um and here are some other uh, resources uh, since all of you have decided to yeah Okay. Plotting that graph. So I was wondering uh, if I'm using mix and if I'm using the array, um, do I have also that uh, virtual separation that for the metrics, or it's going to be all? So I think uh, it should be exportable because I haven't personally t tested it. So please take my words with a grain of salt. But uh, technically, it should be possible to export that through Open Telemetry. and using open telemetry if you are able to export it then you can serve it on any uh, dashboard that you might want to use like signos or grafana i can add just one comment uh, on that open the open telemetry project that just started an effort on the best way to like integrate llm telemetry yeah including all these things so there there is an actual slack uh, channel mm -hmm. that you can find it's like it's like hotel uh, sem 
it's it's there that they're currently working currently working on, on yeah there there is a way um i i can send you some links if you want i'm, I'm researching that right now but there there's a way to get it to prometheus uh using the nvidia case plugin as well for the, the metrics then okay. yeah <laughs> Thanks for answering that question. <laughs> yeah, but here are a bunch of other resources. Uh, a lot of people have been experimenting on DRA. Uh, we, we of course, like uh, were inspired from some of them. Uh, but yes, uh, like again, it, it can be a bit tricky to get those uh, 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 those particular GPUs. But if you're able to, then you should be able to set it up uh, completely fine. Um, but of course, finally, uh, I know. It has already been a lot of uh, lot of information, so I'll be very quick with this. Um, an alternative to all the methods that we saw so far was directly deploying your AI model on top of Kubernetes. The other way is to use orchestrators. So orchestrators internally leverage uh, these DAG-like systems, so directly recycling graphs, where you can think of your entire AI pipeline as multiple workflow steps. And then you can scale up any particular part of the step, for example, training, or pre-training, or data cleaning, or whatever we want, um, because they run natively on top of Kubernetes. So sometimes you, you never know that what part of my uh, entire machine learning lifecycle or pipeline might require more compute. So uh, some, uh, com like, you know, some companies will prefer to use an orchestration platform rather than directly deploying an AI model on top of uh, Kubernetes. And these, generally, these orchestration platforms are Kubernetes native. So like tools like Flyte and Kubeflow, they, uh, the underlying architecture runs on top of Kubernetes. And uh, what they allow you to also do is uh, you can essentially declare during the runtime what, how much GPU and CPU and resource utilization allocation you want to give to each and every step of your machine learning lifecycle. Because every uh, step of the lifecycle is interpreted or represented as uh, a unique thing. So like, you know, as a unique step. Um, so you can allocate, OK, for example, for the, uh, the pre-training part or data cleaning part, I don't need GPU. So I don't need to allocate a GPU for that. But probably for the fine-tuning part, or for the fine-tuning bit and the training bit, I'll need GPUs. So I can assign that uh, declaratively with the help of Pythonic syntax in, in the case of like flight and uh, in, in, in the case of uh, Qflow. Um, and again, like I know we are probably out of time, but here's another uh, workshop for all of you. So if you sign up on Sivo, uh, they have a really nice, detailed. Um, and the great thing about Sivo uh, is that they are the only one of the platforms that actually have a, um, a good way to actually get a uh, what is it called managed Qflow as a service, because Qflow as a project has, I think, uh, probably some of you might be knowing, like 626 namespaces. So it's very complex to set up. Uh, so if you don't want to set up Kubeflow locally in your system, then you can look, look out for managed uh, providers. There used to be, I think, a company called Arecto. They closed. They, don't, they are no longer a managed Kubernetes uh, Kubeflow provider. But um, like I used to use them quite a bit. But uh, for example, I can just quickly show you how the CEO, um uh, cluster would look like. So in this case, let me head over and go to this uh, cluster so you can see that uh, I was basically like before this workshop, I was building this cluster. So this is my Qflow. I can go ahead and uh, log into my dashboard. Uh, here, let me log in with my CVO credentials. And it's an entire Qflow with all of the different components that are there in Qflow. All of them are uh, basically there uh, for you to use. So not have to deal with you know the complexities of running Qflow locally in your system. Um, so basically, the demo really what it does uh, in this workshop, uh, this particular workshop was how do you deploy like a Llama 3 model on top of uh, Qflow. So feel free to you know uh, go through it in your own time, set up the cluster uh, when you sign up on Sivo or any other platform for that matter. We are cloud native over here. So uh, just to be frank on that path. Um, and um, then, of course, uh, another thing that uh, was there is like we gave this talk uh, about a year uh, back uh, around. Okay, thank you. So
uh, I think like it was uh, in April 2023, uh, which is basically making the most out of your hardware uh, axel uh, hardware uh, accelerators in a Kubernetes cluster. So here, uh, basically, me and my uh, presenter, we kind of focused uh, a bit differently, like not on the DRA aspect, but more on the data parallelism and the model parallelism, where basically the technique is that you take a model, you divide it into different chunks and run them separately on every GPU, or you divide your data into different chunks and run them on different GPUs. So just to maximize the potential and optimization of your GPU cluster. And here we also showed different ways in which you optimize your uh, Qflow cluster as as well, so uh, it's it's some uh, good things that we covered. Um, so feel free to you know have a look at this particular talk as well if you are interested in that kind of thing. But as I told you, right, that there are so many different ways of optimizing a GPU cluster or just your Kubernetes cluster in general. Uh, I think like we didn't even have time to cover Volcano. Uh, that's another way of doing it. Uh, again, like I have not. Uh, gone into it myself, so I don't have much knowledge, but that's another way to do it. Like, to just make your Kubernetes cluster more efficient for large scale AI deployments. But uh, yeah, so basically, these were all of the things that we covered. Uh, this QR code will take you to the um, slides. Uh, just let us know if you're able to access them. And uh, these are our Twitters and our uh, CNCF, like we are on the CNCF Slack, if you want to ever have any discussions with us. But I hope uh, uh, you know, like you, 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 you were able to take away something from this session. And I'll be open to questions now. Thank you. Yep. So when are we going to figure it out? Figure out what? <laughs> I think that at least uh, internally at my company, we are pretty much using VLLM right now. So we are deploying VLLM not necessarily on DRA, but we are using VLLM on top of Kubernetes. And uh, that has definitely helped us. So I think uh, most companies are exploring. So I think like NVIDIA has been much more focused on using just DRA. IBM as well has been using more of DRA. Um, so my colleague uh, from that previous talk that I just showed you, uh, Rishit, right? Uh, so he is a university student who uh, is basically leveraging bare bones, uh, you know, like, so he, I think, covers different techniques around, um, you know, all these different kind of strategies around pipeline parallelism, uh, data parallelism. I, I mean, some of them, I, even I don't know. But he's using them uh, during his research at, uh, at uh, university. So I think like everyone is using some of the other technique. So I guess my answer would be that whatever fits the best. <laughs> it sounds like a very diplomatic answer, but I guess um, at least you know with what I've seen is uh, different companies trying out different use cases. For like my company at Couchbase, VLLM was the best tool that we loved to use. Um, so I think it kind of depends. But if you have other any insights, I would love to learn from you. Okay. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Um, the VLM uh, on the NVIDIA, is it um, based on the virtual GPU uh, option of uh, the NVIDIA F100, F100 or is it uh, not related? I mean, if we have our own uh, NVIDIA transfer, mm -hmm. we have not the, the, the professional option uh, for Honestly, I don't know the answer for that question. Because uh, I assume it should be, but uh, I don't know the answer. I'll have to check that. Because I've not dived too deep into the actual inner workings of how it interfaces with the uh, GPU architecture. So I'll not be the correct person to answer that right now. But I can get back to you on this question. Or if anyone in the audience might probably know. Okay. So then, then yeah, it should be possible, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's the virtual part, but uh, and uh, another question: Have you made some uh, benchmark? Uh, uh, I mean, do you know uh, fair scale from Meta? Uh, uh, sorry, what? Fair scale. Uh, fast scale. Fair, fair. Oh, fair. Fair scale. I know what is fair. That's the. Uh, 
Ok. Oh, Ray. Do you mean Ray or? No, it's a PyTorch library. PyTorch library, okay. No, I have not explored that. Yeah, so then you might need like multiple GPUs. So in this case, like different layers of the perceptron are serving on different CPUs if it is not fit entirely on one CPU. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good. Like, what's the name again? I'll probably make a note for myself. It's called. Uh, could you repeat the name again? Fair scale. Fair scale. Okay. This one, right? Okay. I'll I'll make a note for this. Sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, do you mind if we can probably just take a picture together? Yeah. If I can take a selfie? All right. <laughs> because all of you were kind enough to stay for the entire duration, so I think like you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>